Good afternoon and welcome. Glad you could come to this candidate forum. Uh, we know that we're, we have, we're going to have District 65B. That's if you live here, that is your district. Margaret Mary Stokely and Carlos Mariani. Uh, I am Mary Santi. I do not live in this district, I, but I am a league member and a trained moderator, and I will be moderating this forum. We believe the success of our state depends on the values, knowledge, and commitment of our elected officials. Thus, it's essential for the public to better understand the views and the opinions and the positions of the candidates that we elect to office in Minnesota. It is this understanding that better equips us to make informed choices. We appreciate the candidates and audience members taking the time to be here today. Uh, before we begin, you, I mentioned you have cards on your chairs, and if you raise your if you raise your hand, they will bring you another card to ask a question. Uh, so each candidate will give a two-minute introductory uh, statement. The candidates will have a minute to answer their questions, and if there is a for the response, they'll have 30, 30 seconds to answer uh, in a rebuttal. We'll accept your written questions throughout the forum, and uh, they must not be personal. They must be relevant to the state legislature, and they must uh, be addressed to all candidates. Uh, we will give it to all candidates present. Questions that are personal, embarrassing, hostile, or unclear in intent will not be used. And we may consolidate similar questions. So, say uh, several come in on the environment. We'll w ask one representative question. So candidates were not allowed to bring in buttons, signs, t-shirts, or other campaign uh, gear but they are uh, allowed to put their materials on the table and back, so be sure to pick something up on the way out. Please stay as quiet as possible so the candidates have the maximum amount of time to answer your questions. And put your cell phones on silent or vibrate. Uh, members of the media may be here recording, and uh, they can use it for them, the candidates also may uh, record. With that, um, we would have opening statements, and uh, I'll introduce the candidates. So, we are looking for We are waiting, waiting for Carlos Mariani, <coughs> and he is running in District 65B, and his opponent is here, Margaret Mary Stokely. And so I, I would have Margaret Mary begin her opening statement. Thank you, what? Mary. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to try to speak slowly and distinctly so that you can hear me. Can everybody hear me that's in the room? Okay. Um, I ran for this office back in 2016 as well. That was my first time. And uh, I was asked to run this time. It isn't a big uh, Republican district, as you probably know, however, I believe that someone should be on the ballot and to provide a balance in government. So I'm running. I have several um, opinions about uh, the way things are going, and I'll be happy to take your questions about those. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. And now, Amy, <coughs> did you want to hold off on a a asking questions for now? 
Okay, yeah, uh, uh, she's asked me to read the biographies of the candidates. So the, uh, the two candidates for 65A, the other side of the district, could not be here, and I will read their biographies. So Rena Moran is state representative for District 65A, and she was first elected in 2010. And she's currently serving her fourth term. She's deputy minority leader and co-chair of the People of Color and Indigenous POCI Caucus. She moved to the Twin Cities 18 years ago in search of a better life for her children. After arriving here, she became involved with social change work and is now the Director of Prevention Initiative and Parent Leadership at Prevent Child Abuse Minnesota. She has a proven ability to unite people and the passion ex and experience to fight battles at the state capitol. She's passionate about many issues, including education, paid family leave, racial disparities, minimum wage, senior citizens, women's economic security, housing and homelessness, and criminal justice reform. Her opponent, Monique Giordana, was raised in Minnesota and now lives in St. Paul. She's a cancer center clinical pharmacist at Regents Hospital. Her Portuguese father immigrated to the U.S. seeking opportunity and the lessons she learned from him drive her to help people achieve their dreams and live their lives to the fullest. Due to her work within many healthcare systems and her hands-on care for cancer patients, every day she sees challenges we face with our broken healthcare system. She believes every family deserves affordable healthcare and the freedom to choose their healthcare team. She also believes education is the foundation for the future and our students deserve the best teachers <coughs> not the most tenured. So welcome. Welcome to our other candidate, Carlos Mariani. And Carlos, we have already had an opening statement from your opponent. So if you are ready, we'll have one from you as well. Good afternoon. How is everyone? My apologies for being late. I took my grandchildren to apple picking today, and it took a little longer than I wanted to. Excuse and, me. Um, I need to give you this one. Too. I then uh, rushed over to um, to get changed, and then um, typed in my 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 calendar. Just you know, um, nowadays. Um, You're gonna have to talk louder. Okay, so I can just keep using this. So nowadays we, we use GPS and I just you know punched it in and I just followed the instructions and I should know better because I shop at Mississippi Market right across the street on a regular basis. And so I'm listening to um, technology instead of what I know uh, to be true. Thank you for being here today. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to have a conversation about um, this uh, race and uh, my re-election effort, um, conversation with my uh, opponent uh, who I consider a very good person. And so I think we're very lucky. Uh, you can't hear a word. Oh my goodness. Is, uh, should I start over again? Can everyone hear? Yeah. Okay. I apologize, dear. I, I, uh, um, I didn't mean to not be heard. Uh, very quickly, I just want to thank you for allowing me to spend some time with you today and to have a conversation with my uh, opponent uh, in this race, uh, we have run uh, before against each other. 
I consider her a knowledgeable and good person. So I think one of the things that we're lucky in this district is that we have good people who run um, uh, for this seat. And so I look forward to the conversation, to your questions today, and to share my thoughts with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And so we will turn to questions that you have submitted, or and if you still have questions that you would like to submit, please raise your card and the usher will collect it. But the first question will begin with Carlos Mariani. And that question is, as a legislature, let us Legislator, what are your priorities for St. Paul? Thank you. Uh, so let me share uh, two or three priorities with you um, as I seek to continue representing uh, this district uh, in St. Paul at the Minnesota House uh, of Representatives. Um, I, for the last uh, decade or so, have really focused a lot of my efforts in uh, public K-12 education um, issues. And um, I do believe that our state generally does a fairly good job generally in terms of providing good education for our young people in the state of Minnesota. I think it's one of the things that makes us one of the strongest uh, states in the union. However, there are lots of groups of students that we don't do well for. And so I want to continue to apply my knowledge, my experience, uh, my connections, if you will, my perspectives, and making sure that every child, every student in K-12 has a quality education. The final thing, very quickly, I would say is that our city does have some very specific needs, particularly help from the state to be able to fix our big parking ramp uh, downtown. Uh, without that, we're not going to really be effective with economic development. It's a very expensive project. Uh, otherwise, our property tax, taxes are going to wind up having to pay for all that. I want the rest of the state to help us with that. Yeah, it kind of sounds rattly, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yes, Mary, uh, Margaret Mary Stokely, your response to uh, what are your priorities for St. Paul? Well, you know, Ronald Reagan used to say that. Well, I'll say it too. <clears throat> I, I, as a constituent here, and I've been here for nearly four years in this building. I live in the Weinberg Apartments, which is connected. It's on the campus here. So I'm very grateful that the uh, forum was held here so that it was very easy for me to come to it. Can anybody, can everybody hear me? Is this better? It doesn't sound too weird. Okay. <clears throat> As Carlos touched on uh, K through 12, especially um, education, uh, we spend 41.3 percent of the entire state budget on K through 12, which is a sizable budget. Now, two years ago, and it's the budget is presented by the governor on the odd years, so we're in the 17 to 19 budget currently. Uh, the budget that was in place when I ran in 2016 was approximately 70 plus billion dollars for the state of Minnesota. So 40, and that's, I don't know if that includes everything, but that's uh, the, the, the main figure. So 41% of 70 plus billion is a lot of money. Now. Thank you, can you complete your sentence? Oh, sir, yeah, sure. Um, so for instance, nuts and bolts, uh, barely half of the third grade students read at proficient levels. Thank you. Thank you. But we have time for rebuttals. If either of you would like to speak another 30 seconds for a adding comments. Well, uh, I would add that um, very quickly, as, as um, my uh, colleague here has shared, the state of Minnesota does, in fact, spend a lot of money in K-12. It is the single most important investment that we've made. I think as mature people, we, we thought, decided a long time ago our young people are worth it. Um, keep in mind, we have over 800,000 young children in our public schools across the entire state. 
It's not a cheap proposition. So at the very least, we have to make, keep making that commitment to spend that amount of, of money, but then figure out ways in which we can spend it wiser with particular student groups where we're not doing really well in terms of education outcomes for them. May I? Okay. Yes, well, the seat of the pants estimate is that by third grade, the third grade, that's why they measure third grade. Third grade reading proficiency is a bellwether or an indicator, actually, of building prisons. So the fewer third graders that can read would indicate that we're going to need more prisons. So we need to work on reading especially, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Then for the next question, Mary Margaret Stokely, would you begin? And the question is, what will you prioritize at the legislature to address the needs and issues being raised by the growing homeless encampments in St. Paul and Minneapolis? Thank you. That's an excellent issue. Um, the statistics I got are that we have, at any one particular time, we have almost 8,000 homeless in Minnesota. We need to do something different. What we're doing isn't working. Now, I personally have been in a homeless shelter myself. I know what it's like to stay in one. And uh, I would certainly run them differently. But we have other issues. Some of the issues in homelessness are mental illness, drug addiction, alcohol addiction. So if we can try to work on those problems, we'll have fewer homeless. We only have a 3% employment, unemployment, excuse me, only 3% of Minnesotans of, of uh, working age are unemployed in this state. People are begging for workers. So. It's, I don't believe that we have the problem necessarily of people who are not without a job or without a job. But the issues are other issues. Thank you. Thank you. Carlos Mariani. Uh, uh, this is a, continues to be a very big issue. In the last couple of years, I've authored uh, a couple of uh, very big bills that uh, allowed us to redesign the Dorothy Day Center uh, right downtown St. Paul. Um, the second unit is going up right now. I forget the number of units that we're providing, but it's quite a few more units that uh, a number of people on our streets are going to have access to more, much more permanent uh, housing. We need more of those, uh, but that's a good start. Um, as uh, Mary Margaret shared, I think that uh, also surrounding those kind of services, those kind of buildings rather, with good, strong services like mental health services, education, employment services are critically important in order to help people get out of the cycle of not having a home. I have some other thoughts as well, but uh, I do have a good history of authoring legislation to build affordable housing uh, in Minnesota and here in St. Paul. Thank you. And do either of you have more to add? All right. Well, I'll, I'll, add. Yeah. <laughs> you will? Okay. I'll add one more very quickly. Um, there's a lot that's happening in our city, like cities all across the country. We call it gentrification, with people moving into the cities who have moved out maybe a generation or so ago. That's not a bad thing. However, uh, what we do need to do, I believe, is to create powerful incentives and even mandates for those who are developing new units in the city of St. Paul to do so, so that they can, so that those units, those buildings, can be mixed use, so that we have a combination of units where they can make a profit in terms of building and renting for folks who have good money at the same time that there are other units there that are affordable for people who already live in the city of St. Paul. Thank you. And so for the next question, we'll start with Carlos Mariani. What do you think about the 1,000 page omnibus bill? Good thing, bad, do something different? No. Yeah, thank you for that question. I hate those bills. Um, I've gone through a couple of cycles uh, where we've done that. And quite frankly, um, uh, Democrats do that 
uh, often just like Republicans do. And so it's a bad practice, I really do believe, because you're trying to cram into one bill a lot of issues that really makes it very difficult for the public to understand everything that's happening in those bills. At the end of the day, I have voted for those bills because I haven't had much of a choice, uh, but I have certainly fought my own leadership, folks on the other side of the aisle, not to do that. To do government in such a way where the public has an opportunity to see what we're doing and to fully understand, and more importantly, to engage with us specifically on what's inside these bills. Thank you. Margaret Mary Stokely? Mm. Well, I don't know when the legislature started. I'm assuming when uh, Minnesota became a state, but surely we have enough bills by now that we can work on what we have. And I'm just not a fan of constant paperwork and tinkering and all of this stuff. I think some of the basics need, you know, all of the basics need to be addressed. And, you know, if, if I'm elected or when I'm elected, should that ever happen? I'd, I'd work to simplify things. I, I don't like all this complication. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further, either? All right, I have one more question, so I hope you will be bringing them forward. Uh, and this one will start with Margaret Mary Stokely. In the last four decades, our state's redistricting has defaulted to the courts because the legislature and governor could not agree. What better way could you suggest to accomplish this important every 10 year function? Well, I wish I were smart enough and a good numbers person to figure that out. I, I don't have an answer for that. It, it's by population, I'm assuming it should be, and it should be as as a, a, a tight district instead of these long things that go 50 miles, you know, away. So common sense is, a, I mean, other marketing firms, supposedly, they figure out their markets and their population, and they figure out radio stations, for instance, television stations, other profit-making entities figure out where the people are and they corral that. So I, 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 I'm against, of course, trying to gerrymander anything along any political lines either way. Thank you. Carlos Mariani. Uh, how you draw the districts is very, very important. Well, you can draw districts in such a way where you water down the votes of certain people and then heighten the votes of others. It's just not fair. Uh, in Minnesota, I have to say, I think our, our district lines are fairly pretty good. And the reason is precisely because the courts have stepped in because between the governor and the legislature, when they've been divided, we haven't agreed. So the good thing is that the courts have drawn them. I think what we need to do, quite frankly, is to create, and I've, and I've been a co-author of this bill, to create a citizens group that actually draws these lines. Now, our Constitution requires that the legislature approve them. And so I think what we need to do is to have a citizen group, and it should be very inclusive of everyone, people in rural, in urban cities, African American, Latinos, whites, elderly, young, etc., that they draw lines and they forward them to the legislature and we simply vote yes or no. And if we vote no, then it goes back to that uh, citizen group until we can, we can arrive at, at an agreement. Anything further? All right, the next question will begin with Carlos Mariani. Okay. We currently have over 50,000 people who are not allowed to vote because they have previously been incarcerated, even though they have served their jail sentence. Do you think this should be changed? I, I do think it should be changed, and there are other states uh, that do that. Uh, there has been a movement in that direction, and quite frankly, it hasn't been necessarily a partisan movement. There have been Republicans as well as Democrats across the country who see the wisdom in having our people who have paid their price for having done something wrong and now want to be able to be full uh, participants 
uh, in our government, uh, in our communities to participate in the vote. Um, I have been a co-author in a number of these bills uh, over the years. We've been chipping away little <laughs> by little, uh, but I do think it's time for Minnesota uh, to be able to have a full uh, opportunity for folks who've already paid their debt to society to fully participate uh, uh, and be responsible and have resp take responsibility for choosing the government that, that, um, that provides the services that we all need. Thank you. Margaret Mary Stokely. Thank you. I'm not f familiar with every aspect of the law in Minnesota about um, people who have been convicted and are they when their uh, franchise is returned to them. But it was my understanding in other places, as long as you finish your sentence, that means probation as well or parole, then you can vote. I don't know what Minnesota does differently than that, if anything. Now, if the law says finish your sentence and then you can vote, then you finish your sentence and then you can vote. However, I, I personally don't know why anyone is forbidden to vote. If someone's in prison, why shouldn't they vote? You know, why, are they, why is that right taken away from them? They're, they're already paying a price for their crime, but not being able to vote shouldn't be the price, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, and any more to add? I would only say that I think Mary Margaret and I both strongly agree on this idea that um, there's something very, very critically important for every citizen to be able to do, and that's to participate in the choosing of their government. There's lots of folks that make mistakes. These are our relatives, these are our kids sometimes. It doesn't make them any less of, of, of citizens, particularly if they are paying the price that, uh, that, they, that is due to our society. So I'm, I'm pleased to see that there's very strong bipartisan support here uh, for that idea. Thank you. And this next one, we'll start with Mary Margaret Stokely. In your position, how will you prioritize the needs of senior citizens? Well, since I are one, I am one, I is one, uh, I'm very keen on it. I've lived in uh, senior housing now for a total of approximately seven years. I'm uh, 69 years old, I'll be 70 my next birthday. I'm very concerned about the future of uh, senior care. I don't see, for instance, housing. Housing is not, you know, we're talking about affordable, this quote, quote, unquote, affordable housing. I don't believe we have enough senior housing for low income especially. So I think seniors need to stay in their own home if they want to and that the services to keep people in their own homes should be continued and there should be a continuum, a continuum of services for senior citizens that is humane and sensitive. Thank you. Thank you. Car Carlos Mariani. This is a, a critically important uh, question for us uh, as a people, just as it's important for us to, to uh, invest and take care and tend to our young people, we also need to do that uh, for our elder uh, citizens. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just eight years behind you, uh, Mary Margaret. I'm 61. Um, so I'm not quite there, but I am an a a AARP member. I would say there's a couple of things that we need to do. One is to continue our state's strong commitment to Medicare and Medicaid, to look for opportunities to expand uh, uh, those opportunities uh, for our, our citizens, including our elderly citizens. Uh, two, I think we need to protect our health care system uh, and make it better and not do what many folks, unfortunately, on the Republican side of the aisle have attempted to do, which is to turn it right back to the insurance companies to run. That would be a huge mistake. Elderly folks will pay the biggest price as a result of that. The other thing that I'll finally quickly say is that we need to continue to focus on home care services so that as many people who uh, approach elderly age can, ha can remain in their homes surrounded with good quality care. Thank you. And anything further on this, either of you? 
I just want to reiterate and reinforce that. I think it's so important for seniors to have input into the system that we participate in. And I would like to see more uh, town meetings or candidates and people in government to come and speak to seniors face to face and get an idea. Now, for instance, I'm a, I'm a person who, re who has an elderly waiver. I have homemaking services, I have this, I have that, but getting good services is the issue. The state wonderfully pays for things, but the quality of service is the issue. Thank you. All right, the next question then, we'll begin with Carlos Mariani. Do you think that Minnesota should have true early voting rather than through the current absentee voting system? I, I, think, um, I think our state government should do everything possible to encourage our citizens to participate in this critically important um, um, responsibility, duty, and quite frankly, privilege as, as well. Uh, we have been slowly expanding uh, in the last uh, decade in particular in our state um, the ability for folks to easily participate, more easily participate in voting, including getting into more earlier voting um, uh, time windows and, and new processes. I want to see us continue to expand that. Uh, we have to always make sure that the quality of our vote, the integrity of it is protected. Uh, but I believe that citizens in the state of Minnesota are incredibly responsible, very interested in participating in their government. And so yes, I think we should continue to expand that opportunity to vote in earlier times uh, and make it easier to, to do that as well. Thank you. Margaret Mary Stokely. Well, I'd like to say something that's going to engender more questions. So I might have to say something controversial. The, the issue I have with early voting is only one, in that we have the October surprise, and if early voting begins too early, then some of the information that voters really need to make a decision, it's too late for them to, they've already voted. So that's, that's really the only issue I have. It's, um, I, I, I too agree that voting should be easy, I am concerned about um, people being eligible to vote who are voting. So this is it. It's, it's a bit of a conundrum to me because, again, the voting um, too early can eliminate information that the voter needs to make a, a, an informed decision. Thank you. Anything further? I don't know if this was implied in the question. It'd be interesting to learn more about what true early voting means. But I know one of the issues that have, that have come up is, is trying to have earlier and earlier primaries. Uh, we certainly did do that. We moved the primaries uh, you know, until late summer now. So that gives a little bit more time for folks to look at candidates throughout the fall. Um, I'm a little nervous about continuing to move. There are some propositions to move that to June. Uh, I'm really concerned about this idea of us getting locked into an annual cycle where we're consistently about elections as opposed to about governing. And so I think there's got to be some kind of a balance there. Any further there? Okay, we'll go to the next question and it will start with Margaret Mary Stokely. What can Minnesota do to control the cost of prescription drugs. Well, I don't take any drugs, so thank God. I don't take any pills whatsoever and haven't taken any, and not even an aspirin, because my body just uh, doesn't agree with it. I do think the drugs are too high. I don't know what the answer is. Um, because I don't know the entire economics of pharmaceutical companies. I mean, it's a worldwide business. They sell the same drugs everywhere in the world. Why do we pay more? I don't know why, except that, per, that maybe the other governments are subsidizing the, the, the pharmaceuticals. But of course, 
I don't think pharmaceuticals should be out of the reach of anyone that needs it. So we, we should have a, some sort of safeguard to make pharmaceuticals affordable for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos Mariani. Yeah, this is a very complex issue, but it's an issue that uh, everyone, particularly our elderly uh, communities who are much more dependent on medicines uh, than the rest of the population, it's, it's a big challenge in these communities. I don't have all the answers either to this, but I think part of it has to do with being able to marshal the forces in, in, in the marketplace uh, for, so the state can be a large buyer procurer of prescription drugs. Uh, so as, as opposed to letting you and your insurance company fend for yourselves and basically pitting you uh, as folks are looking for profits from these prescription drugs, we can use the power of large buying, uh, centralized, so that um, uh, with larger numbers of, of, of drugs being bought, uh, the argument is to be able to lower the price for that. Expanding Medicare and Medicaid is also part of that, so that the more people that are in those pools, the argument is to lower those prices. Finally, quite frankly, we need to tax the pharmaceutical uh, industries way more because I do believe they're creating a lot of havoc uh, in our society right now. Thank you. Anything further? Well, the, the next question is along the same lines on a little broader spectrum, and uh, Carlos Mariani will answer first. The health care system in Minnesota and the U.S. is not working for many of us. What would you do as a Minnesota legislator to improve health care in Minnesota? Well, we're going to need more than 30 seconds to answer that question, but um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a believer in the single-payer system. Uh, I think that there is a lot of inefficiencies that are uh, built in, baked in, uh, our current healthcare system because we're trying to create a profit for uh, middle people in order to uh, provide access. These aren't, these aren't doctors, they're not even pharmaceuticals, they're not pharmacists, you know, they're basically paper pushers, they're insurance folks, they're not bad people. But the question really is, we spend so much, we spend more than anyone else in the world uh, for healthcare and yet we have one of the least attractive healthcare systems across the world. I think it's time for us to get very serious about a single payer system and really work to uh, drive those, the efficiencies that happen when you're cutting out a whole lot of middle, middle, middlemen guys who are looking to profit uh, from our, our medical needs. Thank you, Mary Margaret Stokely. I lived in Canada from 1969 until 1977, the, the years of Trudeau. It was a pretty, uh, and I enjoyed the single payer system there. However, it was not a federal system, it was a provincial system. So if the state of Minnesota wants to be a single entity, uh, and I said this last time I ran, I, I, mm -hmm. I think that the single payer system works as long as the corruption is held at bay. So it does work well. I'm for that and I, I, I think Minnesota could do it. I think each state should have their own single payer. I think if federal government does it, it's going to be a mess. So yes, I agree with this, and it eliminates the billing issues. The doctor doesn't have to worry about billing codes and getting it turned down and all of this other. That doctor can, or provider can, can serve their patient. So I'm, I'm in agreement for single payer as long as corruption is eliminated. Thanks. Thank you, and there's your extra time now. Oh. Uh, well, I, I would, you know, my, my sister-in-law is a, a doctor. She's an ENT doctor, she has her own uh, clinic. Um, she's an African-American woman, one of the few uh, to be able to pull that, pull that off. We're very proud of her. She delivers a great service. Every time we meet, we talk about this issue and she says, Carlos, I spend more time arguing with insurance companies and not necessarily dealing with my clients and that's where I want to spend my time. I didn't become a doctor in order to have insurance companies gain me and tell me how to deliver uh, medical services. Anything further, Margaret Mary? 
All right, then the next one, you'll be the first to begin. How can we improve our public transportation in St. Paul? One of my favorite topics. I depend on the bus. I have a driver's license, however, I do not own a vehicle. And how I would improve it, I would, first of all, probably, I am against the streetcar line from the airport to downtown. I don't believe it's going to stop often enough to serve the people in between, I call it the flyover zone. So between the airport and downtown, it's already a limited stop. So I, I, this is a first-hand experience for me. I would have the main arteries of the city with the larger buses and then I would have a, what I would call a feeder line of smaller buses weaving through the city to feed into the main arteries. Because you can live in the neighborhood and you walk a mile to the bus stop. That's certainly not going to help me. So I think we should have, a, for instance, along the 54, we should have a limited stop bus, but we should also have one that stops more frequently. It's a half a mile between bus stops on the 54 down towards downtown. Thank you. Carlos Mariani. Yeah, I think Mary Margaret and I share a, a great concern um, about the um, inconsistency in the holes that we have uh, for public transportation. I live on the west side uh, of St. Paul. It's difficult to get in and out of the west side. And quite frankly, even Ubers and Lyfts don't necessarily like going there. Um, it's just the geography. We have to cross, cross the river. Uh, right now the high bridge is closed. It's a nightmare. But let me just say that I think one of the things that we have to talk about is how do we get more cars off the road? Um, lots of cars in the road only make it difficult for our bus systems, whether our buses, whether they're large buses or small buses, to be able to effectively navigate uh, those streets. We need multimodal uh, approaches. Uh, we're moving in that direction. You're seeing much more bicycling uh, that's happening in our cities. So I think we need more dedicated lanes uh, to do that. That gets people out of cars. Getting people out of cars means that the rest of us who like and depend on buses can have those freer lanes move, moving so that we can access either those smaller or larger buses. Margaret Mary Stokely. Well, I'm going to... Did you? Oh, you did. Yes, I, I already had my say. <laughs> Thank you. And then, and is there anything further either of you would like to add? Just repeating, winter's coming, and I know that I'm not going to be able to use the buses in the wintertime. Um, just getting to the bus stop and getting on the bus is pretty near impossible with the snow banks. So, and I know we have metro mobility and other things. However, I enjoy taking the public transportation when I can. It just needs to be a better system because if we want more cars off the road, like Carlos says, and I'm, I'm all for that, then we need a better bus system. Thank you. Thank you. So the next question will go first to Carlos Mariani. What is your opinion of the crowded apartments recently built between West 7th and Shepherd Road on Otto. Well, frankly, I need to learn more about that. Um, and um, I do think that what's going to happen in our cities, and to some degree it has to happen, is that we have to find ways in which we, in ways in which we can provide quality housing for more people in the cities. Uh, it's long term not supportable for us to just keep growing out and outside of the Twin Cities. It means more concrete, more asphalt, uh, quite frankly, even more rail lines in order to move people around. It means more pollution as well. However, having said all that, uh, what we need is quality housing, not packed housing, you know, not, you know, um, housing that's purely motivated, motivated by <laughs> profit, which means you're going to squeeze as many people into as small spaces as, as possible. We're going to need stronger zoning laws in order to do that. And as I said earlier, I think we also need mandates for developers to make sure that as we're building, uh, and there's going to be more building, that as we're building uh, more multi-units here, 
that we're providing access for affordable uh, units as well. Thank you, Mary. Margaret Mary Stokely. Thank you. We touched on this a bit earlier with the, with I guess with the homeless issue and um, with a number of issues that encompasses everybody needs a place to live, needs a roof over their head to keep away from the uh, elements, have a place to cook your meals and sleep safely. Now, 20, over 25 percent of people in the state of Minnesota spend more than 30 percent of their income on housing. God knows probably it's after the 30 percent we don't know what they spend but housing is not affordable. That's one of the reasons why people are homeless and these apartments down here on Otto who I've seen I don't go that way but uh, they're very expensive. I know that much. I couldn't afford to live there. So you know, I, I don't like unsightly apartment buildings built in lovely old classic neighborhoods. I think there are places that apartment buildings would be better served and uh, the, the bus line could go there, for instance, and it would be easier instead of trying to get something in a neighborhood where nobody can get the bus. Thank you. Anything further, either, on these apartments? All right, I have one question remaining. Uh, we'll close after that if, if you don't have any more to ask. Uh, this one will begin with Margaret Mary Stokely. Are you committed to operating, uh, to gathering and utilizing community input? How do you do this? How do you involve senior citizens? I'm glad you asked that, whoever asked that. One of the things in my closing I was going to bring up is the caucus uh, system in Minnesota. We have precincts. We have over 4,000 precincts in Minnesota. A precinct is made up of approximately 1,500 registered voters, give or take. But in general, that's the figure. If we if each precinct is supposed to have not only a chair, but a deputy chair from each party. That precinct chair is the conduit from which, or with which, by which, citizens have input into government. We don't work our precincts in Minnesota because of the caucus system it doesn't encourage that. So I would try to change the caucus system. I think it's very important to have input other than, uh, and I don't think questionnaires, written questionnaires, the only way is people that you know. For instance, I live in the Weinberg Apartments. If you have anything to talk with me about, I can carry that. I am the precinct chair of this precinct. Thank you. Thank you. Carlos Mariani. Well, the way I've uh, tried to do this in the past is to hold community meetings of my own. Uh, we call them town hall meetings. Typically, we'll hold them in community centers. Um, in the last couple of years, we've had residents who live in big um, high-rise units who have asked me to come out um, and you know they'll provide access to their community room. And so we've done them uh, there as well. Uh, I've done these uh, both as uh, individually as a state rep, uh, but I've also done them in partnership with my colleague, um, our senator, Senator Sandy Pappas, I've done it uh, occasionally with my other colleague in the House, Representative Rita Moran. Um, and I've also done it with our Congresswoman, our terrific Congresswoman, uh, Betty McCollum. Um, I will admit, I don't do enough of them, uh, even though we've done them. And so I would say, uh, I'd look for opportunities to build relationships with you um, so that uh, perhaps you can invite me uh, here even, uh, and I can uh, have these, kind of, uh, these conversations in your space uh, with you. So uh, looking to build relationships with you so that we can have more of those conversations. Thank you. And we'll now turn to closing statements. And for that, we'll begin with Carlos Mariano. Well, again, thank you for the um, opportunity to, to uh, be with you, uh, to meet you, and to take your questions. There were quite a few questions. You're a very, you're a very curious crowd, but you're also very engaged. A group of citizens and residents here. 
Um, I would, as I said, like an opportunity to do more of that with you. And so please, uh, please reach out. I'll leave my cards here. Uh, and hopefully before I leave, we can get a couple of names and we can uh, organize an opportunity to come back. I would love to continue to be your state representative. I will continue to fight, quite, quite frankly, for a government that continues to be our government, not government controlled by the rich and the powerful and people who live away, but government that's controlled by us so that it's our tool to help make our community stronger and better and make a real positive difference in your lives and the lives of my children and grandchildren. Appreciate your support. I appreciate the leagues uh, doing this. One, one of the most terrific American civic organizations ever invented. Uh, I've participated in a number of these over the years. Always appreciate the opportunity to hang out uh, with the League of Women Voters. Thank you so much. Thank you. Margaret Mary Stokely. Thank you. I, I probably can't top that, so I won't try. I think Carlos did a fabulous job expressing our appreciation to the League of Women Voters for having this forum and for doing the work that you do for, I don't know, 100 years probably, since suffrage perhaps. My, I'm, you know, you've heard our, our answers to all the questions. I believe in uh, fiscal responsibility. I believe in spending money wisely. Uh, one of the things is my pet peeve, as I mentioned in my last remark, is about the caucus system in Minnesota. The caucus system in Minnesota is supposed to be a place where citizens come and perhaps uh, submit resolutions that are supposed to go up to the next level with the congressional district uh, convention and then to the state convention that the, so that they become part of the party platform. That really isn't happening because at the caucus level, there isn't any record of any votes. Where I lived in Illinois and Missouri, when you run for precinct chair, which is called the most important office in the country, that's the person that talks to the people, to their neighbors. They organize a precinct. They have block captains. They, their block captains look and listen every day to their neighbors, not just every two years. This is my issue. I don't like this every two years you go out, you shake hands, and then two years later you see somebody else again. It should be a daily thing. You should know your neighbors, you know what's going on with your neighbors and what they need. So if we can change the caucus system to a, uh, where the precinct chairs are actually elected by record, if you want to know who your precinct chair is in Minnesota, you're going to have a hard time finding out because there's no record of it. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our forum. Thank I you. want to thank, thank you very much. Good to see you. Home thank for you. allowing us to be here and partnering with us in this forum. Thank you to the candidates for stepping up and for coming out to have your voices heard. Thank you to the audience and all the volunteers working this forum. Don't forget to vote on you know when? November 6th. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.